Hi, I'm Rhonda Buss, and welcome to another brand new episode of So Busted's Material Witness. I'm very, very excited today, but first I have to give a little bit of a, a background of where we are. We are actually in a hotel room in downtown Chicago, and we are near uh, the Northwestern Hospital, so I'm sure you're hearing uh, an ambulance as it's going by because the emergency room is just a few doors away. So. Uh, I'm sorry about the background noise, but uh, you can't always pick where you're going to be. Uh, today, I am with Helen Howie. Welcome. Thank you. It's and, lovely to be here. And she is a, a couture seamstress, couture dressmaker, and uh, she has a very fascinating story that I think you'll enjoy, and um, uh, just her road to where she is today sure. is is quite impressive. Um, she actually began her career as? As a pharmacist. Yeah. And I think that where you've ended up, that the two, you know, one actually is not that different from the right. other. Yes. So, uh, you know, pharmacists must be very precise in what they do. Uh, it's n not on to hand out the wrong medication um, and uh, accuracy is really very important and the same is true in couture dressmaking. Um, fit is important and the road to good fit involves um, some mathematics and lots of accuracy and careful um, construction of the garments. So. So how is it that you went from being a pharmacist to being a couture sure. dressmaker? Sure. Well, I, I started sewing when I was 10, uh, living in New Zealand. My mother um, Catch the accent. had four <laughs> daughters, and I was the youngest, and she taught each of us to sew. And uh, during my teenage years, I enjoyed making garments for myself, and mother was very... Um, uh, very strict about things. You, if you started it, you had to finish it. If you uh, made a mistake, you had to redo it. And if you were going to wear it, you needed to be able to wear it inside out. So those were basically the three rules. And uh, then I studied pharmacy and immediately married. And within the first year, had a child. So I was doing a little bit of uh, pharmacy work when I could, um, but very rapidly had three children under four and a half. And um, a month after the third was born, we moved from New Zealand to Iowa um, into the coldest winter that they'd had in a hundred years. Um, and uh, my husband was doing further study and was gone long hours and if I had wanted to continue with pharmacy I would have had to go back to school to uh, get qualifications that were acceptable um, both in the state of Iowa and everywhere else in the United States um, and two years of study with very young children and a husband that was gone all the time was not going to work. No, no. So that was the point at which I moved on from pharmacy and became a full-time mother, doing a little bit of sewing, but not very much. And it really wasn't too much until my eldest child, my daughter, went to college that I began to um, do more uh, sewing. And then from there, um, worked in a fabric store and did a little bit of teaching. And then um, in 2001, my daughter became engaged to be married and asked me to make her dress and I found um, a class that I could go to, a couture sewing school which I'd wanted to do for quite some time and went to that and made my daughter's wedding dress and at that point I fell in love with couture sewing and I have to say um, through Susan Kelji I learned a lot of what I know today. And of course, as always, we had a bit of a conversation before we actually started doing the taping and um, 
Helen made the comment that when you learned to, oh, excuse me, when she learned uh, couture sewing, that yeah. everything just seemed to fall into place. It did because um, I now had the control over each part of the garment that I was making. So. Um, the mathematics that I had used a little bit of um, in my sewing, which of course also I'd used in the pharmacy, um, now I was using much more of it in the, in the precise couture techniques that I had learned. And uh, I just felt that I had so much more control over what I was doing. I understood the process um, and everything just seemed to fall into place and it was at that, that point that I really didn't return to uh, sewing as I had done for many years. So, so we were also talking about um, just couture sewing and the difference between being expensive and being a piece of quality. Yes. Yes, and that was uh, also one thing that Mother was insistent on, that you bought the best quality fabric that you could afford. And it probably was a carryover from the war years uh, when you had to make things last. And she felt that if you used really good quality fabric, then your garment would look better and would last longer. And um, to this day, I... I wear garments that I made 15, 20 years ago and um, you really can't tell. Um, so it's a pleasure to know that you know good quality is also long lasting quality. And the, uh, the amount of work that you put into a garment can mm -hmm. be a yes. lot. <laughs> yes it can but um, you know that I, I've throughout my life done a lot of handwork and couture uses a lot of hand sewing and I really find it therapeutic, I find it uh, relaxing, I find it um, enjoyable. Um, I even like to put in zippers by hand because um, they go in correctly and perfectly Each the first and every time. time. Yes. <laughs> so um, I'm a convert and uh, um, now I love to teach what I, I have done for uh, quite some years. Right, so Helen spent a number of years as a dressmaker when she was living in St. Louis, Missouri, yes. Yes. and had a, a lovely uh, business there, but uh, life has changed yet again. Yes, it is. Yes. And so um, she has is evolving into a different career, and um, or a different aspect of the same career, mm -hmm. and that's in teaching. And yes. what do you enjoy about teaching? Well, I, I love to pass on what I've learned and um, to make it an easy process for other people, an understandable process, to help them to have the light go off, uh, or light go on, should I say, in terms of how the process um, evolves when you begin a garment from the very first purchase of the fabric right through to the completion of the garment and the joy of wearing what you've constructed. And um, I've, um, as I've learned to, to do this, I have honed my skills by teaching because when you teach, you actually understand the process um, in a much more refined way. Right, because just because you can explain something to one person doesn't mean you can explain it to every person. Right. That's, or that's explain true. it in the same manner to every person. Yes. You, you have to learn how to, tailor, to um, actually tailor it to each and every person. Right, and I think that, that we understand that a lot more nowadays because we understand that people have different styles of learning. So part of the challenge of teaching a group of people is that every person in there will have a different take on how they learn to do it correctly. So it's, um, it, uh, teaching has its challenges, of course, um, but it also has tremendous rewards as you see other people understanding the process better.
Mm. So uh, Helen is actually in Chicago right now. Yes. I didn't go to Helen. She came yes. to us. And she will be teaching a three-day seminar over the weekend, and it is on? I entitled it Dressing for the Holidays. Um, so uh, initially I had thought of this class as a dress class because I guess that is what I've taught the most of. But um, holiday wear encompasses all sorts of other things. So I have different garments being constructed during my class, class uh, in the next few days and I like to see myself as being there to guide the process for each person who attends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after the first of the year you're, you will be teaching a class in, in New, New Orleans. Orleans. Yes. And what will that class be on? Um, so it's called the Lace Top class and uh, so we'll be constructing tops out of lace um, and it can be anything from just um, a um, accessorizing with lace to a full lace uh, garment. So, yep. Nice. Yes. And other classes that uh, Helen teaches is um, one, I have a garment here. This is a sheath dress. And um, sadly, the screen just isn't large enough to pick up the whole thing. But um, tell us just a little bit about it as far as the neckline finishing the sure. armhole finishing sure. the, and of course the um, the back zipper is put in by hand and the there are this is a, a an actual boucle and you can see that it just squishes up in a right. ball most people I would not squish up their garment but I know this is okay with Helen yes. and the nice thing about it is you can you can squish it up and then it will actually come out and look just like it did before you squished it, which is yes. really quite nice. So it makes for the perfect, perfect travel garment. Yes, it does. So this um, this is made with a uh, boucle, and this is was a very, very um, loosely woven boucle, uh, so much so that I knew it would have to be um, given some body to maintain its shape and not to sag. And so the whole garment is underlined with silk organza. Um, and then the, uh, the front is quilted. Uh, the, the outer fabric, the fashion fabric, is quilted directly uh, onto the lining fabric. And then each of the side seams here are done by hand. So you can see, you can act, I think you can see the, yeah, you can see the quilt lines there, the stitching lines for the quilting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so why did you do that? Well, because it um, it gives it body, but it also stops it from sagging. And so in a sheath dress, this particular pattern that I used has uh, bust darts and waist darts for shaping, um, but it, it only has side seams and a back seam. And so there's not a lot of seaming there to hold the fabric in place. Mm -hmm. So by adding the quilting, uh, you can uh, keep it from drooping um, and it just looks fresh and lovely every time you put it on. Um, and so her a large... Mother, excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. but her mother would be quite proud because it actually does look as lovely on the inside as it does on the outside. Right. Yeah. And a large part of this particular garment, because of the quilting, is done by hand. So the neckline is stay stitched on the fabric by machine, but then folded down and catch stitched in place. And then the lining is just folded in and slip stitched in place. So uh, there's no machining around the neckline. But you can also see that there's not, you know, typically when you make a dress like this, the pattern is going to come with a facing for the armhole right. and a facing for the neckline, right. which this is really quite lovely because when you wear this, the lining is right up against your skin it all is. the way to the edge. Yes, yes, it is lovely. And, and the same process occurs for the, um, the armhole. Um, you know, stay stitch the fabric, then turn it in and catch stitch it, then turn in the uh, lining and slip stitch it in place. I don't know if you can see it or not, but they're just 
lovely little hand stitches all mm -hmm. along the neckline. Mm -hmm. So it is really quite lovely and it's just kind of a dream just to hold in your hands. Yes. But one thing I do want to say is that the quilting is not done by hand, the quilting is done on the machine. Yes, the quilting is done by machine and so it's very advantageous to have a walking foot on your machine or some sort of um, a, you know, foot that helps you. Some machines have inbuilt, um, I don't even know what they call them, but uh, um, an attachment that is like a walking foot but is part of the machine. Um, I've used both, I think a walking foot does a good job and even a Teflon foot will aid the process. Um, but lots and lots and lots of pinning of the lines where you're going to do the quilting. You'll notice that, um, we'll just turn this back out the right side for a minute. So uh, there are lines going across the fabric. So when you do your vertical lines of quilting, and I would recommend vertical rather than horizontal lines, you don't want any of those horizontal lines to distort. You want to keep the integrity of the design. So uh, I do lots of pinning and remove each pin as I get to it. Um, and I think this one is quilted about an inch and a half to two inches apart, which is fine. But don't you find that with the walking foot, there's less distortion in there the fabric? Is less, there is less distortion, mm -hmm. yes. Where so. if you use just a regular straight stitch foot, then you would see yeah. quite a bit of mm -hmm. distortion and mm -hmm. pulling of the fabric. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then the hem is done by hand as well, and uh, okay, the zipper so was hand-picked as well. So it's all fully encased? Yes, fully encased, um, with a little, well, this, you know, normally I would do a sheath dress with a little bit of a jump pleat at the bottom for the hem, because it, it gives some wearing ease, but when it's all quilted, you don't need that wearing ease, so you can uh, just turn it over and make it flush with the outer fabric. So. Yeah. So we also have a jacket that she mm -hmm. did. Yes. So again, this is a loose weave. Um, and it's rather dark, so we apologize for that. But yes. you can see the boucle, and the lighting in this hotel room is far from the best, so we apo I apologize for that as well. But the fabric, it's, it's a very loose weave. It's mm -hmm. lovely. But yes. if you will open it up, and this you can see, and you can see all the lines of quilting mm -hmm. in the jacket and here again it's just yes just roll it in a ball or put it in a small package in your suitcase and pull it out and wear it so it's actually very very um, great fabric to work with and uh, and here again um, you'll notice that you know typically on a jacket you're going to have a facing but there is no facing the silk goes right to the edge of the fabric and is all hand stitched down. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now did you underline the jacket? I did with underline silk that. Organza? Yes. Yes, I did. And um, it just uh, this is a not only is it a loosely woven boucle, but it's also um, very soft. So to give it a little bit more body, um, I think the silk organza was a really good choice with that particular fabric. And and it's not, this jacket is not done in a traditional French jacket style. So it's, it didn't in fact have hand set in sleeves. I did a combination of uh, French, style, French jacket style um, techniques and regular sewing techniques. So it's, um, it wasn't quite the labor intensity that you get with a French jacket. But this is definitely a jacket that you could easily throw on with everything from a skirt to a sheath dress to, to a pair of jeans. Yes, absolutely. And it's versatile because the boucle has probably four or five different tones in it. So um, that you can't really see, although maybe a little bit. Maybe a sheath. little bit, yeah. a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the classes that you um, teach now, mm -hmm. what classes do you teach? You teach the classes on doing the right, sheath dress? the sheath dress. Lace. Lace. Um, I haven't done any jacket classes for quite a while, but that's... But you have. Yes, I have in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I teach um, 
more sort of workshop short classes. Um, so for instance, on boucle, you know, uh, putting together a little workbook so that when you sit down to work on a boucle jacket or a boucle dress, you know exactly what you should be doing and how to set up your machine for it and what are the things that are going to help you to do that. So I've found a few of those technique classes um, are quite important, but I, I don't have a um, extensive class schedule um, juggling other factors in my life, um, but occasionally I'll do a fit class and um, occasionally um, I've, done, I've taught a class on ethics. Um, so a variety of different classes and just um, when I'm asked to do it or uh, when it's appropriate. And I do teach classes for the Association of Sewing and Design Professionals um, at their conference each year and also for the American Sewing Guild Conference as well. So, yeah. So one of the little hints that she gave you when she was talking is that if you ask, so if you think that you would like to put together a workshop in your area and have Helen come and mm -hmm. teach the workshop, uh, she is definitely open to that. And um, sure. there will be a link below uh, where you can find her website and um, contact Helen about doing a workshop because I know the one in uh, New Orleans that was a class that she was contacted about and right. it was such a success that they asked her back for the second time sure. around. And it's so, just full. Yes, just right. You just, know, yeah. don't want to mislead you. Um, right. It's full. But um, that is a group of ladies who um, they all enjoy getting together and they enjoy um, learning the couture method of sewing a garment. Yes. So if you would like to do the same, that is definitely a possibility and Helen will come to you. So you just need to contact her and yes. to get all the particulars about it. So what do you enjoy most about teaching? I think the satisfaction of seeing other people understand the process and create just wonderful garments um, that they're so thrilled to finish first of all and to have learned how to do it and to wear and um, I always get a kick out of the fact that quite often they will send me a photograph of where they've taken their garment and what they've worn worn it for and um, how they've finished it yeah mm -hmm. so. and, and and I think in the end it's about building an elegant lifestyle yes it is Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add today, Helen? No, not really. Um, yeah. You know what? There's one thing I would like to add, actually. Um, it's a big secret, so we can't know, we can't ask too much about what, <laughs> what it was or how it happened or anything like that. But um, every year, the uh, Association of Sewing and Design Professionals, they have a competition, uh, they set a challenge, and Helen decided to enter this last year. I did. And what happened? Well, uh, it was a design challenge, which um, I had felt pretty uh, stymied in my designing um, in recent years, and but I decided to challenge myself and enter. And uh, we were in Dallas for the conference, so it was uh, concerning um, uh, the, the explosion of innovation and design that occurred in the 1950s in Dallas, Texas, translating that into a modern garment um, for 2018 with the same sort of innovation. And um, so it's, uh, it will be in Threads issue number 203. Um, and I can't give you any more details about my garment um, in the meantime, but um, I hope you'll look forward to seeing that when it comes out. And that should spring. be May of next year, yes. right? Yes, yeah. late April, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, one other little criteria of the challenge was that it had to be a garment that would have been suitable to have been in the window of Neiman Marcus in what year? 
uh, in 2018. So no, really, but oh, in 1950s. Yes, in the 1950s. Yes, yes. Yeah. and um, if you don't know, actually, the birthplace of Neiman Marcus was. Dallas. It was. Yes. yes. So um, so I think it was a fun challenge. So I don't even know, and I've known Helen for quite a while, and I don't know anything about her garment, uh -huh. but I'm excited to see that issue when it comes out, and hopefully it'll be on the cover. It should be. Well, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. You know? So we'll, we'll, yes. we'll put our two cents out there now. Threads. Yes. It should be on the cover. Yes. So... Anyway, thank you so much, Helen, for joining oh, us today. Thank you for having me. It's been and, a delight. Um, again, all of her information will be below, so you could contact her about maybe putting together a class for yourself and other of your sewing friends. And I'm sure Helen would very much enjoy meeting you and passing on a little of her knowledge. So. Sure. Again? That would be lovely. It would be yes. lovely. So thank you again, Helen, and thank you for stopping by and spending a little bit of time with me. And um, it's always a joy to have you. So until next time, keep on sewing.